I want to get right to it. This is, we've gone through seven churches, and this is the last one. Where does the church go from here? Okay? In church here. So there's only one place for it to go, and that's to heaven. We're going to see that in chapters 4 and following. Okay, let me review real quick. I'll show you where the church is right now. It's not healthy at all. I'll show you what you can do and the advice that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to give, not to the church as a whole, but to individual believers. Okay? Let me look at this board real quick. I'm not going to flip the board over today. Everything that we need to see is on here. Okay, so we're going to see a big picture. Jesus addressed the seven churches. And there's only two of these churches that he had nothing negative to say. Okay, one was the church of Smyrna, who was, which was undergoing a lot of persecution. And the church we did yesterday on the church of Philadelphia that was involved in worldwide missions and the Lord Jesus Christ is opening doors for them everywhere. And he did that because of the reasons that I stated yesterday. For one, they had a lot of faith. They had a little strength. And they were actively engaged in wanting to fulfill the Great Commission. You can also see here on the condemnation. So if you ever wanted to evaluate your local church, the way to do it is come here. You get these things, you do a little grid chart, and you, you see the things that Jesus is looking for. After all, it's his church that he likes that's happening in your church and things he did not like. What did he not like? Okay, first of all, the first church of Ephesus is because they were sound doctrinally and they were doing a lot of good things, but they didn't have any passion. They lost their first love, so Jesus tells them to rekindle it. The second church, the one in uh, Smyrna, uh, he, he liked the fact that they were being faithful, even though they were being persecuted to the death. The third church in Pergamon, he did not like the idea that this is the first church that began to compromise. Uh, and I've already shared with you that the emperor uh, Constantine came on the scene and he elevated the church from being persecuted to being prestigious. And he gave titles to uh, the clergy and all that. And that began the formation of what's called Romanism or Catholicism. And a lot of heresy that was going to come into the church. This was then greatly facilitated uh, in the church of Pergamon, in which they uh, gratefully compromised. Also in the church of Thyatira, where they were tolerating Jezebel, who was leading people to do things within the church that were sexually immoral. They were combining paganism and Christianity. Then you have the church of Sardis, which is basically by this time, they were dead. Okay, uh, in other words, they were more like a monument than a mission. Okay, they were like a statue. In fact, they even invented a bunch of statues and they put them all through the church and they put uh, colors and glass plane and all that and all these paintings and all that. They were basically a dead church. And then you have uh, the church of Philadelphia and the Lord Jesus Christ didn't have anything bad to say about them. You can look at this chart and you can take your church wherever it is you know, uh, what Martin Luther did in the Reformation, how he exposed the Catholic Church and all their heresy, and just evaluate your local church based on this grid chart. Jesus is evaluating the church as a whole. Now we come to the church of Laodicea. This is the last church of the seven churches that Jesus is going to address. Let me read to you this passage. Uh, just a few short verses, and then I'm going to explain it to you and tell you where we're at today and where we're headed. Okay, these are the words of the Amen. Okay, the beginning, the authoritative one. The faithful and true witness, not a false witness. 
the ruler of God's creation. In other words, this is all about what I did and how I'm working through the ages. And today I'm working through the church, not Israel. Okay? I know your deeds. Again, he said that with every church. I know. And look at what he says, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I am about to. Now, if I said that to somebody, hey, I'm about to, that means it's going to happen pretty quick. Okay, so pay attention to this message today. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. It's repulsive to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's, here's a very insightful uh, observation that the Lord Jesus Christ says about the church. He says, you say, I, don't, I didn't say, but you're saying this about yourself. You say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. You know, I see all these mega trees. You go in there now, it's like going in the mall. <laughs> they got coffee things, they got snack bar, they got all kind of uh, various things. have nothing to do with the church and what Jesus Christ died for. Okay? And they're, they're, they're comfortably in their smugness. They even have padded seats, you know, and, and, and these uh, elaborate praise bands, you know. So he says, you realize, he says, you, you, you say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth, do not need a thing. But you do not realize, and look at what he says about them. They're, they're true spiritual good. You're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and solve to put on your eyes so that you can really see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am standing at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will go in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and I sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, let's look at this chart. The church of Laodicea, it's, it has nothing good to say about it. If you see here, every church era had a particular time frame historically. From the past, uh, uh, apostolic church from uh, 30 AD to 100, all the way down to the lukewarm church, which I believe uh, it began around the 1900s. It really came in full force in the 1980 after the Jesus Revolution and all this contemporary movement got moved into the church along with a lot of uh, church coach management professional skills uh, they they substituted pastoral ministry to be an outsource to licensed psychiatrists and psychologists and so-called uh, Christian counselors for a fee they did all these different things they replaced the prayer meetings with yoga and, you know, frivolous activities like bingo and all this other stuff that had nothing to do. They lost their vision for missions. And uh, they may have given a little bit or they, instead of having people committed to doing missions and all that, we'll go on a trip for one week out of every couple of years. And, you know, that way we can say we did our thing and we're supporting a, a ministry. But and Jesus says, so this came on, this, this lukewarm, this smugness, this sense of carnality that came into the church that a lot of people that are born into this era don't really understand or notice the difference. Okay, they don't have anything to compare with unless they go to the scriptures and read the scriptures of, as to how the Lord Jesus Christ evaluates his church and what the church really should be and look like. Okay, so he tells them you're lukewarm, which by the way, lukewarm, in Laodicea, every, every city was really significant 
and symbolic of what it represented, okay? In Laodicea, they had to have the water piped in to the city. So as the water would come down, it would warm up. Okay, so by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And it was say, so people don't like lukewarm water. They either like it hot or cold. And Jesus is using an analogy, something that these people really understood because that's how they were getting to, that's how they were getting to, that's how they were getting to their water from, uh, into Laodicea. So, somebody was calling me. And so I put it on speakerphone so they could hear me speak. <laughs> and then I turned it off. Okay, so uh, when Jesus says you like lukewarm water, they ready. Oh, yeah, I know what that's like. That's the water we get, you know, as we turn on our faucet or we go and collect it. It's, it's repugnant. Okay, so he says you're lukewarm, you're wretched. Think of that word, wretched. What comes to mind? That's Jesus saying that. You're wretched. Man, that's... That's... If somebody was to tell me, Manny, you know what? You're wretched. I'd have to... I'd, have, I'd bow my head and think about, gee, I'm wretched. I wonder why he said that of me. And, and I'd have to do some really deep evaluations to what made them think of me in such a negative way. Pitiful. Oh, man. Now, when I think of pitiful, I think of somebody that's, you know, <laughs> that, there's nothing really good to say about them. You know, they're, they're basically, uh, you know, clueless, lifeless, uh, low lives. Okay. Poor. Now, of course... Jesus was not talking about poor materially. He was talking about poor spiritually. Blind. They were blind. Because remember, they were saying that they were one way. We have a lot of that identity problem today, don't we? People with gender identity. You know, this whole inclusive, inclusivity uh, ideology that's coming on. we got to embrace everybody. we got to love everybody and love what they do and all that. And, 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 and that doesn't come from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's blind. I put a little chart up here, a little diagram here. And this is the situation in the world today. The Bible tells us all through the epistles that the world is under a delusion. It got us in the delusion into the world because they resisted the truth and refused to believe. So he sent them a delusion so that they would believe a lie. Had they responded to the light that God had given them, God would give them more light. But they didn't do that. Now what's sad is not only is the world under the delusion, but the Lord Jesus Christ is saying also, along with that, the church is blind to its true spiritual condition. And the way the church is presenting itself to the world is it attractive at all? They're trying to be the world in order to attract the world, and they've lost their testimony, their sense of saltiness, their sense of light. This is the condition of the world today. Look at what's going on in the news. The, the, the whole world's under delusion. All these liberals, uh, you, you can't talk reason with them. You know, for people to say that a girl can be a boy or a boy can be a girl, that's not even logical thinking, okay? But you cannot reason with them. Meanwhile, the church is blind to its true condition. So you got a scenario and a dynamic that's right for what? The rapture. Yeah. Yeah. Right around the corner here, if not today. You know, I'm thinking about the Bible says that what would the Lord Jesus find you doing when he returns? And I thought to myself as I was getting ready this morning, Lord Jesus, if you come back today, you're going to find me 
teaching about the rapture. <laughs> Lord, I was just talking about that on FaceTime. You know, that would be great. That'd be awesome. Oh, there I go. <laughs> he says, way to go, Manny. <laughs> you know, what is he going to find you doing? Is he going to find you lukewarm, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind also? Naked? He is. He's going to find a lot of people. He said, many will be ashamed at his coming. You know, they'll be engaged in frivolous activity that don't really matter. Not doing things that count for eternity. They're so caught up in the world and climbing that corporate ladder. They have lost sight of eternity. They have lost sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't have any love for him. They tolerate all kind of nonsense and Jezebel and all kind of heresy. Okay. They worship things and promote idols like money, power, prestige, personalities, rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, you know what, I'm about, I'm just, I'm right there, I'm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. The church today is oblivious to their true spiritual condition. Totally oblivious. I recognized this many years ago. A lot of other Christians have too, that the church is gone. You know, like I said yesterday, any church that has to have two services is already defeated. You know, if your church got a contemporary, uh, traditional service, I'd leave that church. You know, because they're already admitting defeat. They're not unified. Okay? And they're, they're going to split church service on the basis of, you know, preference and taste, which is nonsense. Okay? That's not church. The church used to be a life ship. Now it's a cruise ship. In fact, it's true. You can, you can go on the internet and actually go on cruises with certain popular pastors. I'm, I'm, you think I'm kidding? I'm not. They go to Alaskan cruise. We're going to have all these contemporary Christian artists on there and all that. We're going to have a really ball, good time. But I talk to some of the people that go on those cruises, and they tell me some of the things that happen while they go on there, and some of the things and temptation stuff that they fall into. It's, and, and Jesus' evaluation of all that is, you know what? You're lukewarm, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's reality. That's your real, true, spiritual condition. If you don't like this message, shut me off. Okay? Some of you in those kind of churches, you need to get out. Okay? Pastors, if you have churches like this, you need to stop it. You need to behave yourself. You need to get on doing what God called you to do. And that's preach the word without, with, with, without trying to compromise or to appease everybody. You're never going to do that. The only person you need to appease to, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, King of King and Lord of Lords. And right now he's saying, you're spiritual, poor, blind, and naked. And then he's going to say, and he's going to make an individual appeal. And here's the, here's the scenario. It's Jesus Christ who's standing at his church knocking on the door and nobody recognizes him to open the door and let him in. If that is a most sad sight. So Jesus doesn't, he says, hey, I got an individual appeal to you. And he says this, here I am. I stand at the door. If anyone hears my voice, you know, how do you hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ through his word and in a quiet way? And he's saying to you, I know it's going to cost you, but come on out of there. Come fellowship with me. But this is, first of all, it's two conditions. He says, I will come in and eat with him. In other words, you're going to have deep spiritual fellowship and eat with me. He says, be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. He says, I advise of you to buy from me gold as if refined by fire. He's not talking about precious metals. He's talking about you. He's saying, hey, 
You've been all this. You've been in your smug, seedy church, whether you're an elder, deacon, pastor, or whether you've been traditionally in your denomination, which God doesn't like. You know, that's another form of division. Pet P that came out of the protest movement and Reformation. Well, we're Wesleyan, or we're a Methodist, or we're Presbyterian, we're Baptists, we're free will Baptists. You know, we're Southern Baptists. That's all what? Wretched, poor, blind, naked. He says, I spit you out of my mouth. You know, because it indicates divisiveness. And he says, I advise you to buy from me gold as if refined by fire. What happens? You put gold into the fire. It refines it. It takes all the impurities out, which is painful. You want to have intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? He's making a call. He stands at the door and knocks, but it's going to be painful. And then he's going to do another thing, too. He says, all those who I love, I discipline, I chastise. But he's doing it because he loves you. He says, i got to take all this crap out of you. All this bad thinking out of you. All this bad theology out of you. All this bad tolerance out of you. I got to purge all that out of you so that you can become a useful vessel for me. You ever gone through that? I have, many times. The longest time I ever went through that was in Southern California. I'll never forget it. And, and, it, and, and I'm telling you, God put me through the fire. And I remember I used to get up in the morning and say, Lord, God, I learned already. I'm done. I'm finished. I got the message. He says, no, you haven't, Manny. I'm not done with you yet. The next day I did the Lord, I'm like, no, you're not. I finally quit praying that. And one day I woke up, I was a different person. Well, I wasn't perfect by no means. I said a long ways to go, but I was, there were some things about me that was never going to change again. Okay, you go through that kind of fire, and God disciplines you for your best. You come out of it a different person. Next thing you know, you got this intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you go into one of these churches, like churches of Laodicea, and right away you sense, I don't want to be in here. I don't like this. Jesus doesn't like this. You know, you have that sense of spiritual insight and discernment to recognize what is smug and what is real. Okay, you say, man, you're just being critical and no, you don't, you know, you don't understand her. I'm not the one that did the evaluation. Jesus is. And he says, if you lay out the sea in church, you're lukewarm, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. And it's so bad right now, people, that I'm about ready to spit you out of my mouth. And I'm going to come and grab what's left of my body, individuals, and pull them out of this world with the rapture. And then I'm going to begin that great tribulation to test the quality of the people that are left here. And what few believers that come to know Christ here, if they make it alive, then come and be with me for the millennial for a thousand years. What happens after chapter three? You don't see the church anymore in the rest of the book of Revelation. The next thing we know, we find John, not on the island of Patmos, but in heaven in chapter four, five. Read it for yourself. Okay, yeah, the whole world's under a delusion while the church is asleep. And it's going to hell in a handbasket. I can't stand the contemporary church, and I know the Lord Jesus too. I spit it out of my mouth as well. I feel sorry for these pastors that get up there and they promote that. I have no respect for them whatsoever. You know, 
and deacons and elders and so on, they sit in there, okay, they got their titles and all that, but yet they let that church just do that continually. They don't speak up, they don't say anything, just like a lot of the churches did. They, they tolerated the teachings of Jesuit, or tola, tolerated the, this new philosophy and ideology of wokeness, okay, rather than exposing this evil the way the Lord Jesus wants us to do. Not a good message, not a happy message, it's a message of reality and truth. You take and you make of it what you want. But you know, as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That, I don't say that bragging. I say that humbly, you know, because I, I, I can do without a lot of things, but I cannot do without the Lord Jesus Christ and be an intimate fellowship with him. God bless you all.